Tonight, are you a soldier who fought in northern Syria side by side with the Kurds? He's got some harsh words for the president over his treatment of the Kurdish people. That soldier joins RFL. Then, the more we learn about the president's dealings with Ukraine, the more incriminating the evidence. We're going to show you what we mean and separate fact from fiction. Then, our legal panel is here to look at a lot of cases that are in the news, including impeachment, the Varsity Blues college admission scandal, and much more. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thank you for spending part of your Wednesday evening with us. And we begin tonight in northern Syria and President Trump declaring victory, even though pulling U.S. troops has allowed Russia to move in. Today at the White House, President Trump unveiling what he sees as a big success, that Turkey was making that ceasefire permanent in northern Syria. This was an outcome created by us, the United States, and nobody else, no other nation. Very simple. With the U.S. now on the sidelines and Russia moving in, President Vladimir Putin helping Bashar al-Assad's Syrian regime reassert control in the region and redrawing the map with Turkey. The new deal allows Turkey to keep the area they've already taken and forces the Kurdish fighters to pull back from more territory to the east and west along the border. Turkey's President Erdogan telling the Kurds their positions will be destroyed if they don't pull back even further. Many Kurds feeling at this point they have no choice but to comply. They claim more than 200 civilians were killed during the initial Turkish invasion that followed President Trump's decision to pull America's troops out of the area. The fighting forcing the Kurds to abandon their watch over thousands of captured ISIS members. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper downplaying the prison break to CNN. Of the 11,000 or so det detainees that were in prisons in northeast Syria, uh, we've, we've only had reports of a little bit more than 100 that have escaped. Esper says the ultimate goal is to bring the troops home entirely. But they'll first be going to Iraq, a controversial decision in its own right. Iraq first telling the U.S. that those troops are not welcome. Now, giving those troops four weeks to leave but that offer may not even be certain. And now, more and more U.S. soldiers who served in Syria, they're starting to speak out. That includes this man, who submitted his story to The New York Times. Three months ago, I was in northern Syria with the Army's 34th Infantry Division. Weeks ago, our commander-in-chief announced he was pulling our last troops out of the region. I say, why are we protecting Syria's land? Ever since, I haven't been able to sleep at night. Breaking news, Turkey has launched a military offensive against the Kurds in northeastern Syria. In just a week, hundreds reported dead. Around the world, condemnation growing. Our complete withdrawal from Syria is unstrategic, immoral, and ultimately un-American. Don't get me wrong, I agree with President Trump's statement that we should end endless wars. I don't think we should have been in Iraq. I certainly don't think we should be in Yemen. Overall, it is good for us to get out of the Middle East. But we do that by building and maintaining alliances, by creating a peace process that maintains stability in the region and supporting our allies. That's how we work ourselves out of our jobs. I was stationed in July in Kobani, Syria. In Kobani, there's a little cafe where we met with our Kurdish counterparts. We drank tea uh, in little glasses. I met a Kurdish fighter who asked me if the U.S. would ever leave Syria. I reassured him, of course the U.S. would never leave Syria and abandon the Kurds. They're our partners. I was wrong. Last week I read that Kobani was attacked by Turkey. That's the same city where I drank tea with the Kurds and reassured them that we'd have their back. Now I worry that those same men may be dead. I can't believe President Trump let this happen. I joined the army to follow in the footsteps of my grandfather and great uncle Milt, who both served in World War II. Now the same army that stopped the Nazis is being sent home to clear the way for an ethnic cleansing of the Kurds. That piece you just saw appeared as a part of video op-ed in the New York Times. The headline, 
I joined the army to prevent genocide, not to pave the way for it. And joining me now, the man who wrote that piece and produced the video, Captain Alan Kennedy. He serves in the Colorado National Guard, and he was in northern Syria this summer. Um, first of all, Alan, thank you. And um, I also want to speak for many when we uh, thank you for your service to this country as well. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, I, I just want to say that I'm speaking as a, a private citizen, uh, not on behalf of the Department of Defense and certainly not on behalf of President Trump. Absolutely. Um, I want to get your perspective because we've heard some different voices um, in the last week or so, and, and, I, and I think you echo some of them, and, and I'm curious your perspective on others. Um, first off, um, some folks who um, were boots on the ground like yourself there, um, American soldiers in their perspective, and I want to single out a few of them and tell me if they speak for the main or the minority. Uh, one soldier said, it's unacceptable to turn our backs on them to a tyrant like Erdogan who views all Kurds as terrorists. There will be a whole generation of U.S. military that will never forget this betrayal nor stop apologizing for it. Another said, I feel physically ill with worry and concern and deeply ashamed that my own country will permit this fate to befall our close allies who did all our fighting for us when we had the power to prevent it. And finally, another officer said, as Turkey attacked, I couldn't help but feeling ashamed, number one, to have been part of it, and number two, that we, America, I believe are violating our values. America, in my mind, is still the shining beacon on the hill, but we're not living up to that right now. Uh, words that I think many of us were shocked that in uniform, people talking about abandonment, betrayal. Do these voices and yours speak for the majority of the troops who northern Syria is not a dot on a map, but you were there and you saw and looked into the eyes of these Kurds? Yes, absolutely, Rich. Um, I believe it's representative of uh, not only the people, who, the, the soldiers who have served in, in Syria and our Kurdish counterparts, but all but uh, the soldiers all around the world and uh, a lot of veterans as well. Um, there's a deep sense of betrayal um, uh, from President Trump's decision to withdraw completely from Syria and abandon the Kurds. Now, the president has said at different times uh, that the Kurds love this deal, but the Kurdish um, uh, senior commander, the commanding general um, of the SDF, um, he says otherwise. He says that the president's decision to pull the U.S. troops out uh, has allowed ethnic cleansing of the Kurds. Our trust in the U.S., he says, is at its lowest. We're asking the president to keep his promise. Abandoning the Kurds, he said, is hurting the U.S. interests and reputation, and it's not acting according to American principles. And finally, he said that if ethnic cleansing happens, it will be the U.S.'s responsibility. Um, I'll, I'll share some of the things the president has said on this, but he basically says it's the Kurds' problem, it's not ours. Who's right? Uh, I certainly disagree with President Trump on that um, we have a moral responsibility to prevent genocide. And I think it's disingenuous to uh, claim credit for saving the Kurds when we put them in jeopardy. Um, they stood side by side, they served side by side with us for years in the fight against ISIS. Um, and we, we had given them the impression that we would have their backs and to abandon them now, I think, is an abdication of our moral obligation. You've seen the images, um, and unlike the vast majority of us, you can put a face to them, but the shot of, uh, you know, uh, those Kurds throwing potatoes um, at the uh, uh, Humvees clearing out of the area, um, that must have had a more resonant image for you than for us. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's a, even when I was in, in Syria uh, three months ago, um, my Kurdish counterparts were worried that the United States uh, might abandon them. And I had reassured them that, that of course, we would, we would have their backs, that we would be a good ally, uh, a good partner. I was wrong. And... We need to take back that, that moral responsibility 
the president clearly looks at this uh, in a different perspective. And as we saw from your video, you agree with him that it's not the U.S.'s um, job to be in endless wars, but there's a way to do certain things, especially for people uh, who bled alongside us for both their own, but for American interests as well. But the president, he clearly looks at it in a transactional manner. He said, among other things, um, and we talked about this at the time, it's since been forgotten, but he said, talking about the Kurds, they didn't help us in the Second World War. They didn't help us with Normandy. He went on to say, we never agreed to protect the Kurds. The Kurds fought with us, but they were paid massive amounts of money and equipment to do so. And today, he said, we've moved, but don't worry, we're protecting the oil. Um, I got to imagine for folks who risk their lives to try and also engender trust, um, and we all know the Ranger motto in this, you, do, you don't leave a guy behind, that when you hear that, forget who you voted for for president, it's not important. My God, what kind of a message is that for any other ally to ever trust us again? Absolutely, Rich. Um, as I said in the New York Times, is keeping our promises to our allies too much to ask? I certainly hope not. Um, we are the most powerful nation in the world. We asked the Kurds to suffer uh, the most during the fight against ISIS, and they took the brunt of the casualties um, in, in, those, in that fight, and, and we would not have been successful to the extent we were against ISIS without the Kurds. And we need to remember that. Um, it's, it's ridiculous to talk about, uh, about, the, about where the Kurds were historically. Um, the Kurds have been abandoned uh, many times over throughout history, and they, they, frankly, are looking for a place to call home. Um, tens of thousands of, of the Kurdish people are now displaced. They're now refugees. Uh, thousands of Kurdish soldiers died in the fight against ISIS. We, we need to stand by our allies, not abandon them. And just to put up um, a number or a face to um, what the captain's talking about, you're talking about not only hundreds of thousands, but 80,000 children, children. I think the idea that the imagery is that, hey, these are just a, a group of glorified terrorists uh, uh, fighting in some transactional deal on our behalf here. You know, no, that, that's not accurate. And moreover, when you look at the faces, I think um, you can understand why so many people are so upset. Now, finally, from, from my end, um, I, I'm curious what, uh, obviously, the abandonment, but we're turning it over to Erdogan. We're turning this over to Assad, to Putin. Um, I, I got to imagine, um, you know, there's the good guys and the bad guys, and the bad guys are making the decision about what happens next here. And in a Middle East that you put your neck on the line here, as so many other American soldiers did, it seems like the wrong guys are getting to decide what it's going to look like in the future. Absolutely. Even even uh, Senator Mitch McConnell and Senator Lindsey Graham have said that this decision will lead to a reemergence of ISIS. Um, that's pretty clear. Uh, we've already started to see an uptick in suicide bombings. Um, Kurdish politicians have been executed, assassinated. Kurdish journalists have been killed as well. Uh, and the Turkish-backed militias have promised publicly to to do beheadings. That is horrific. That's medieval. Um, that's, that's what uh, President Trump's decision has paved the way for. And that's why we're talking about potentially genocide. And as we mentioned right off the top, a very fluid situation. And where this goes from here, no one knows. But I know people are fearing potentially the worst. Uh, again, uh, Captain Kennedy, uh, thank you not only for your service, but also uh, and I know you're speaking for yourself now, but I sense you're speaking for a lot of people uh, in uniform now and have worn it in the past. Thank you again. Thank you, Rich. I uh, very much appreciate it. So you heard the soldier's perspective. But before we go to break, I wanted to bring you another one. Um, I want to bring you the reading of an open letter from the wife of a special operations soldier who was based in this part of the world um, and who counted Kurds as allies. This letter she penned was to the Kurds. Take a listen. Dear Kurdish soldiers, you don't know me, but I have known of you for most of my adult life. 
When my military husband and I quickly married, knowing he was deploying to the Middle East to be part of the 2003 invasion of Iraq, I feared what he and his special operations unit would face when they arrived. How bad would the fighting be? How long would they be gone? Would he survive? Months later, he returned and recounted to me what he could about his experience. I asked how he had made it through. He replied, we had help. We had the Kurds. He told me stories of how the Kurdish people in northern Iraq supported the troops, advised them, stood by them, fought shoulder to shoulder with them in combat, and became allies and friends. And I became grateful immensely, unwaveringly, and forever grateful for you. Since then, the word Kurds in my home has meant something. It has meant ally and friendship. There are pictures of Iraqi Kurds alongside my husband and fellow soldiers in our home. I have a coffee mug with depictions of female Syrian Kurdish soldiers on it that I proudly use to remind me of you. My children play soccer in their Kurdistan jerseys. The Kurdish people are not nameless, faceless people across the world. You hold a place of honor and respect in our home. It's important to me that all of you know that I owe you so much. My husband is home safe today after years of fighting, and I know you helped make that happen. I pray we return to your side, that we stand by you, and that this has not all been in vain. Forever yours, a grateful wife. And when we come back, we switch gears. The latest on impeachment, including damning testimony from the ambassador to Ukraine and why yesterday could be a game changer.